I would like to start by thanking the organizers for organizing this virtual meeting and also for giving me the opportunity to present this talk. So what I will do today is I will start by discussing well-known facts about uh, the relation between inflation and correlators and conformal fuel theory. I think this has been known for more than 10 years, but it would be interesting, it would be useful to put in context the second part of the talk, uh, where I will discuss the solution of the conformal work identities and then sketch the proof of conformal invariance. And finally, I will conclude. Okay, so let's start from um, the relation between inflation correlators and conformal field theory. Now, inflation correlators encode spatial correlations at the end of the inflationary period. And for slower models, the geometry is approximately the sitter. And this implies that the late time behavior of perturbations are dictated by the structure of asymptotic solutions at future infinity. Since the isometries of the De Sitter group in D plus one dimensions coincide with the conforming group in two dimensions, one would expect that uh, cosmological correlators would be constrained by conformal symmetry. So what I will do in the next few slides is I will make more precise the statement by using uh, connection between the asymptotic structure of the sitter uh, to that of under the sitter and then using well-known facts from the ADS CFT correspondence. Okay, so the more general asymptotic solutions of the sitter and under the sitter were analyzed almost 40 years ago in works that were done independently of each other. So the case of the sitter and in four dimensions was analyzed by Starobinsky in 83, and then a few years later, Feffman and Graham analyzed the structure of the asymptotic solutions with a negative cosmological constant. To a large extent, these two works are the two communities, cosmology community and uh, the, the, the mathematics community do not know the, the, the works of each other. And even today, I think it's not known how closely these two works are to each other. In fact, the results are essentially identical. And it, this was really took a long time to be recognized. And uh, we recently gave a new proof in a paper that appeared a couple of years ago. So let me sketch this relation. So both cases, both the DS and ADS case can be described by uh, in at the same time uh, using a line element of the following form. So with appropriate coordinates, um, we can write the asymptotic solution in exactly the same form. So if we take uh, this parameter sigma to be minus one, then the Z coordinate is a time coordinate well, if we take it to be plus one, then it's a spatial coordinate. And then if we expand close to the conformal boundary, which is a space like um, for the sitter and time like for under the sitter, then we find exactly the same form, namely the one over here. I will discuss in the next slide the meaning of these two coefficients, G naught and G3. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say here is that uh, that G2 is that it is locally related to G0, and it's again is the same relation both for, for DS and ADS. Um, there are exactly analogous formulas for other fields, so everything that I will say here generalizes to any other fields one may wish to consider either in the sitter or in under the sitter. So now let's go to discuss a little bit the physics of these two terms. First, using ADS-CFT. So G0 is considered as the source that couples to the dual operator, which in this case is just the energy momentum tensor. The field equations impose no conditions on G0. So G0 is an arbitrary data. On the other hand, G3, the second condition, the second coefficient over there, is now it encodes correlation functions of the energy momentum tensor. 
Now, invariance of the bulk theory under diffeomorphisms implies that this correlation functions, which are obtained from G3 by function differentiated with respect to G0, satisfy a number of identities. And once one works this out and finds out these are precisely the conformal world identities of the boundary conformal field theory, including the issues of quantum anomalies. So this derivation over here uses two pieces of input. One is the asymptotic structure, namely that we have this form of asymptotics. And the second is that the bulk theory is diffeomorphism invariant. Now, when we go to the sitter, we have exactly the same information because the asymptotic structure, as I just reviewed, is identical. And of course, the theory is invariant under diffeomorphisms. This means that the conformal world identities that we derived in the context of ADS-CFT also hold for perturbations of the sitter. Now, at the face of it, it looks like what we're constraining is the wrong pieces, the wrong piece of isotopics. So in cosmology, what we want to know is we want to start from quantum fluctuations at early times and see how this affects the leading behavior as we approach the end of inflation, which in this coordinates is at z point to infinity. In other words, we want to know how this parameter g naught is affected if we start with a uh, fluctuation of the, the early universe. But I have just argued that the this conformal world identities really are about this piece G3. So it's D3 which is constrained, G0 is unconstrained. So how do we reconcile this? So this is one piece which I think there is a little bit of confusion in the literature. So in some of the cosmology literature, it is argued that G0 and G3 are related by shadow relations. Actually, the discussion in the literature is more about um, scalar fields, but it's exactly analogous over there. So there is an analog of G0 and there's an analog of G3. Now, it is true that G0 and G3 have dimensions associated with shadow fields. So if uh, G3 has dimension delta, then G0 has dimension D minus delta. However, in conformal field theory, only one of these two is an operator, the other is a classical source. So in this case, G3 is the expectation of the energy momentum tensor, so it's the analog of the operator, where G0 is a classical source. Now, in cosmology, what relates these two is really the choice of vacuum, for example, the Bunch Davis vacuum, and then the use of Roskin relations that link G3 to G0. So then, once you have constraints of G3, then you can transport this into constraints on G0. In some of the liter recent literature, for example, people analyze constraints on the scalar H invariant fluctuation zeta. Now, zeta is really dual to an operator of dimension three and not of dimension zero, as sometimes one says in the literature. Now, if you look at the leading, at the asymptotic behavior of the solutions of zeta, then it looks like that the leading or the term behaves like as if it was a piece, an operator of scaling dimension zero. But actually, this leading order piece is not an operator, it's the analog of G0. It is actually just a, it is related to, to the uh, trace part with, with respect to, to G0. So this the, the leaning on the piece is, is, is a source, is not, is not an operator. Uh, actually, in CFTs, there are no operators that have scaling dimension zero apart from the high identity operator. Okay, so, so far we have only discussed the issues of symmetry. So we started from symmetries and we saw what this implies. So uh, none of this really uses as input any underlying duality. However, these constraints I discussed from, that come from bulk diffeomorphisms are completely consistent with uh, the, uh, the picture of uh, 
uh, the CETA CFT dictionary, where the partition function of the dual quantum field theory computes the wave function of the universe. So in other words, the wave function of the universe, which is as it arguments the, um, the values of the fields at the initial slice, uh, is related to the partition function of the dual quantum conformal field theory, where the same quantity here is now the source for the dual operator. So for, for, the, for the case we have been discussing, here would be the, so this, this phi here would be the value of G naught over here. And uh, so on one hand would be the initial condition we impose on the metric, and on the other hand would be the source of the dual, uh, the dual operator, in this case, the energy momentum tensor. So then once we have this, then we can compute cosmological observables using the usual formula from quantum mechanics by squaring the wave function. And then uh, when you do this, you know, the wave function has now has an expansion in, in correlators, and it is these correlators which are constrained by conformal symmetry. Okay, so this is the review of the relation between inflationary correlators and conformal field theory. So now we're going to move to the new part. So having established this link, then I will devote the rest of the presentation in describing the general solution of conformal world identities for scalar operators in momentum space. So this will be based on two papers I wrote with Adam Zofsky and Paul McFadden. With one appeared last October and one appeared just this month. And I believe Paul will also describe some aspects, some different aspects of the same papers in his, in his talk. Okay. So I will start by reviewing the results from position space, which are well known since the 70s. So in position space, the endpoint function of scalar operators takes the form I indicate over here. So there are some factors which depend on the positions. So these factors uh, take care of the scale uh, of the scaling of the correlators. And then there is an additional function that appears, which is a general function of cross ratios. Now, this formula here makes sense for any n greater or equal to one. So if we look, for instance, for case n equals one, so that would be the case of one point function, then um, we can see by looking at this expression over here, so here, the alphas that appear over there are related to the scaling dimensions via these relations. And the alphas also satisfy these conditions. So if we put n equals one, so then this becomes delta one equal to zero. So the only operator in the theory that has one point functions is just the identity operator that has dimension zero. Similarly, if you put, uh, if we look at n equals two, then uh, we'll find the, the standard expression. We'll first, these relations here would imply that uh, the dimensions of the two operators must be the same, and, and then we get the standard relation. n equals three, again, we get the standard expression. So this function here appeals only when um, n is greater or equal to four, because otherwise, we cannot form cross ratios. So the cross ratios have the property that are invariant of the conformal transformations. So any function of the cross ratios respects conformal invariance and therefore uh, respects the fact that this correlator is conformal invariance. So conformal invariance does not constrain the form of the function of the functions of cross ratios. Now, this is also obtained using position space methods, and they use the fact that in position space you can trade spatial conformal transformations for inversions, and then it's, it's very easy to convince yourself 
that this expression here is invariant under inv inversions. Now, till, uh, uh, till recently, it was not known how to generalize this results to momentum space, even the question of what is the analog of cross ratios was not really known. So what I will do in, uh, in the remaining of the talk is I will first present the analog of this slide, but now in, uh, in momentum space, and then I will explain why the correlator is conformally invariant. Okay, so let's first start with a statement. So the statement is that uh, in momentum space, the general solution of the form of work identity take the form I indicate over here. So this is a Feynman-like time integral, so it involves a number of integrals of a momenta. And this integral of a momenta is done over and n minus one simplex. And here I indicate a sketch a simplex. So a simplex has a property that um, if we erase any of its vertices, let's say we erase this one, and all the lines that connect to, to the rest of uh, to, to the rest of the simplex, then what we remain with is now a lower dimensional simplex. That can be an n minus two simplex. So now the prescription is the following. So given an n minus one, n minus one simplex contains n vertices. So in this, these are the, the positions where we insert the operators. So in each vertex we insert an operator and then uh, along each edge that, co that connects any two vertices, we introduce an internal momentum. And then the integral is over this internal momentum. Now at each vertex, we have a momentum conservation, which is uh, taken care of by this delta function. So now if we have an endpoint function, then we have n such uh, momentum conser conserving delta functions, one of them gives the overall momentum conservation, the other n minus one can be used to eliminate some of these integrations. For instance, if we look at uh, four simplex, which is what I have here, so I have five vertices, and then you can use those to eliminate uh, four, of the, four of the internal integrations, and then we're left with an integral over six internal momenta, which just for to give an example here, I chose to be the ones I indicate over here. So momentum going from P1 to Pn, P1 to P2, P2 to P3, P3 to P4, and P1 to P4. Now the analog of cross ratios in momentum space is given by this expression, which looks very similar to what we have here, except that now, what it appears in the numerator and in, in the denominator are not differences of positions. So here the x, p, r are the differences of positions, but rather there are momenta that go from one vertex to the other. So the all possible cross ratios are given by selecting four vertices and then writing down a scale of iron combination of the momenta that, that, that go from one vertex to the other. And similar to the case that uh, we had in position space, we now have a function, a general function of uh, the cross ratios, which is not restricted by conformal invariance. Okay, so what I will do next is I will first introduce a slightly simpler version of these correlators and then use that in order to prove conformal invariance of this expression. So this somewhat simpler version are the so-called mesh integrals. So these are given by an almost identical expression. So if you compare these simplest integrals with the mesh integrals, the only difference is that instead of f, 
we have a factor of one. And I have also introduced some numerical constants, which I'm not going to explain here, but they are needed for the things I'm going to discuss later on. Actually, this expression is not only equal to simplex integral where this f is equal to one, like one would naively think. So if I put f equal to one here, we're getting this expression. But actually, this is uh, simplex, a simplex integral reduces to a mesh integral every time this functions of course, cross ratios is a monomial with general exponents gamma i. So the, the way to see this, this follows from the following fact. So we've seen that um, we have this constants alpha that appear both in position space and in momentum space. And these alphas are related to deltas via these linear relations. Now, when n is between uh, one and three, these are a unique solution. But uh, if we are in n greater than, than three, these relations view, viewed as linear uh, equations that relate the deltas to the alphas, actually admit an n times n minus three over two family of solutions, which are parameterized precisely by the gammas. And one can check that uh, the difference between the different solutions just amount to considering in the numerator an f, which is given by, uh, by, by a monomial. So the reason these expressions are also dis dis distinguished is because these are actually the Fourier transforms of the products of differences to some powers. So if we look at the expressions over here, if we remove the f and just keep this part, and if we get this from that part, and that part just gives this mesh integrals. So this mesh integrals have a remarkable recursive structure. So if you start from, let's say, a three simplex, this part over here, suppose we know this mesh integral, then you can obtain the mesh integral of the, uh, the n simplex. So the n, the n minus one simplex is obtained from n minus one by putting a new vertex that connects to all other vertices and then include momenta that run between the various new edges that connect the new vertex to all the old vertices. So here, by just uh, again using the explicit expression we have here, one can check that the, the mesh integrals satisfy this recursive relation. So we have a new delta function because of the new vertex, we have the old, the old mesh integral, and we have some new denominators that depend on the new momentum. Okay, so now, uh, Okay, we have defined the simplex integrals. We also defined the mesh integrals. Now we'll proceed to, to show, I'm, I'm gonna sketch the, the proof of conformal invariance. So proving conformal invariance means that uh, we prove that uh, the dilatation word identity is satisfied and the spatial conformal word identity is satisfied. Of course, by construction, the, the expressions are already invariant under the Poincaré group. Now this one is, uh, the dilatation one is, is, is very easy to check, so I'm not going to discuss this further. So the, uh, the hard work is when we go to the spatial conformal word identities. Now in momentum space, we don't have the useful trick to use the inversion, so we really have to tackle directly the uh, spatial conformal word identities. So these have the following form. So this k is the sum of n terms, each of them acting on one of the operators. And then each k is a second order differential operator in momentum. So to check that the correlator is conformal invariant, we need to check that uh, this operator here annihilates our endpoint function. So I will start by checking the conformal invariance of the mesh integrals. 
So this is done by using the recursion relation I just reviewed, so this one. So it turns out, and this is, this is part of the hard work, one can show that uh, the action of a special conformal word identity also has a recursive structure. So it can show that if you act on the mesh integral it involves an n minus one simplex, this is given by an expression that involves the application of the special conformal word identity to an n minus two simplex. So this means that we can now set up an inductive proof. Indeed, it is trivial. It's very easy to show that uh, if we act with a generator on M1, this is zero. And then if you assume this is satisfied for N minus one, this, this formula here shows it satisfies for the MN. So we just, uh, we just proved that um, this mesh integrals are conformal invariant. Now, once we've proven this, then the next step is, is very simple. So the step where we actually now we're going to prove that uh, the simplex integrals are conformal invariant. So now we want to show that the integral that involves an arbitrary function f uh, u of hat is also conformal invariant. So this is obtained by observing that uh, the special conformal uh, the special conformal operator is a second order differential operator. And this means that when it acts on the integrand, the answer would necessarily take the form indicated over here just by using the chain rule. So there will be terms with no derivatives of f, would be terms with one derivative of f, and terms with two derivatives of f, just because of the using the chain rule. Now, we already know that if we choose f to be a monomial, then uh, the corresponding integral is invariant because it's just a mesh integral. We just proved that mesh integrals are conformal invariant. So this fact here fixes the form of this constants that appear over here, even without computing them. Just to give an example, if I choose f hat equal to one, so I put here one. So this goes because f is one, and this goes as well, and this is one. So we get this expression. But now we already know that uh, this expression, if we integrate over momenta, we should get zero because we know this is the integrand of, uh, of the mesh. So this means that this constant here is necessarily a total derivative. And one can use exactly similar arguments if we choose f to be either one of the cross ratios or a product of the cross ratios to obtain the general form of the other two coefficients, this one and that one. And then one can apply this in here and then uh, Using that, one can show that this, the integral is always a total derivative. And this establishes the conformal invariance of the simplex integral. So as long as this function here is twice differentiable, then the simplex integral would be conformal invariant. And in the paper, we also presented two alternative proofs. One is using the melvin barnes transform of f of u. So if f of u has an bounds transform, therefore, namely can be written in this form, then uh, the invariance just follows from the fact that uh, of the conformal invariance of the mesh integrals because this is just a monomial in the cross ratios. And we just proven that so the, the conformal invariance of, of uh, the mesh integrals is equivalent to conformal invariance with the f being in a monomial. And we also gave an alternative proof where we used the expressions after we integrated out the delta functions. Namely, if we start from the expression here and we integrate out the delta functions. This is the most straightforward way, the most straightforward way to do the, the proof, but it's also the most tedious. Okay, so um, 
this is what I want to say about uh, the solution to the conformal word identities. So let me briefly conclude. So what I will discuss in this talk, uh, in the first part, I explain the connection between conformal field theory and cosmological perturbations. In the second part, I presented the general solution of conformal field theory, scalar endpoint functions in momentum space. Now I've got to connect the two. Uh, then uh, this is what I need to do. This, this result suggests the review should suffice to obtain the late time behavior of scalar endpoint functions of any scalar field for any mass in the sitter by just using the results I review in the first part of the talk. And if we're interested in a slower old inflationary model, then one can again use results and conformal perturbation theory in a way we described uh, about eight years ago in these papers to obtain inflationary endpoint functions. Now, all results are described here. They use very few assumptions. In particular, the analysis use no OPs or no analytist properties. Um, and uh, it would clearly be interesting to now input, to have more physical input into the general solution and just describe. Thank you.